Well, we've been talking about some carols, and we're going to look at another carol today in our sermon series, The Carols, creatively titled, correct? Uh, we're going to be looking at a song we just sang a moment ago, a song, Away in a Manger. Let me give you a little context for the song. I don't know if you saw it as the song was up there, but when it says unknown at the bottom of the screen there, that means we don't actually know who wrote this song. For, for a number of years, it was believed that Martin Luther was the one who had written it, but after they'd really dug into it and done some studies, they could find no records of Martin Luther writing it. And so um, over time, it has switched from being kind of a, a Luther song to being an unknown song. They don't really know exactly who wrote it, but that really doesn't matter. It's a beautiful, wonderful song. I love, love singing it. And... Uh, the mystery maybe adds a little bit to it, just keeps it more interesting. And, and as I said, I think it's an amazing song. I've always loved this song, Away in a Manger. Um, it's touched hearts for now hundreds and hundreds of years. And as to exactly why do I like this song, uh, it, it just touches my heart when I sing it, right? Uh, there's something about imagining Jesus stripped of his godness, stripped of his heavenly realm of glory, being born in this low place on earth, showing us that none of us are too low for his grace. There's something about that that speaks to me. I love that. Um, A side note, if you haven't seen it yet, go see it. Go see the story. It's over in um, Brainerd at the movie theater there cute, cute telling of the story of Christmas from the perspective of the animals. It's an animated movie. It's rated G. It's fun. Bring your grandkids. Bring your great grandkids. Borrow the neighbor kids. Bring somebody. It's, it's, a, cute, it's a cute story. Uh, it really is. It's a cute story. It's worth going to. And so uh, I went with my son a few weeks ago and there wasn't a lot of people in the theater. My son went yesterday with some friends. There still wasn't a lot of people in the theater. It's a story we should support. I don't promote a lot of things, but that's one I think that's worth going to for what it's worth. Um, so, cute story. Anyhow, as we dig into the story, though, we, we think about this, this idea and this phrase that comes from this song, and that's what I want to focus on. And, and my hope is as we dig in on the specific phrase I'm going to say here in a moment, that, that as you worship and as you move forward in the years to come, maybe, maybe this song will take a little deeper meaning to you. Maybe it, it'll spark a, a memory of this morning and uh, of what we've experienced, and maybe it'll jolt you back into a place of alignment with the Holy Spirit, that it'll just make the season come together for you, I hope. And what I want to focus on is that little phrase where it says, the little Lord Jesus, right? We, we sing that, and, it, and it's a, the little Lord Jesus. I, I love that phrase in the song. And, but unfortunately, in, in some ways, focusing only on the baby Jesus probably is a little bit of a disservice to us. I mean, Jesus isn't just the little uh, six-pound, eight-ounce baby Jesus, right? Um, there's so much more to what God intended. And so rather than focusing on the size of, of Jesus, what I want to do is focus on the Lordship of Christ. And so the key thought to this message, and if you want to write it down, is simply this. Jesus is Lord. Everybody say that with me on the count of three. One, two, three. Jesus is Lord. In fact, 740 different times in the New Testament, Jesus is referred to as Lord. 740 times. I occasionally tell my wife this. Sometimes you've got to repeat things to me. Sometimes you've got to hit me over the head with a two-by-four so it gets into my thick skull, right? I think 740 times might be just that two-by-four to the side of the head, right? Make no mistake. Jesus is Lord. Let's look at that in the context of one of the most classic Christmas songs and Christmas verses, one of the most uh, quoted passages that goes along with it, it comes from Luke 2. You couldn't see it, but as we were singing off of the sheet music, uh, and it probably has this in our hymnals, at the bottom of Away in the Manger is Luke 2. 
And so in Luke 2, this is a passage we're familiar with. You can't watch the Charlie Brown special and not hear it, right? One of my favorite parts of Christmas every year is Linus getting up and proclaiming the gospel on national television. It's awesome. I love it. And there it says, the shepherds were watching the flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared and said, do not be afraid. I bring you good news or glad tidings, right? Good news of great joy that will be for all of the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. This was the news that they had been waiting on for centuries as Jews. And the angel arrives and says, He has come. He is Christ the Lord, the Messiah. And so at the very beginning of the story, it's established that Jesus, the Son of God, is born. And He is the Savior of the world. He is Christ the Lord. And the big question that I want us to deal with today is this. What does that mean to us? If Jesus is Lord, what does that mean in our everyday life, right? If we're married, what does it mean to our marriage that Jesus is Lord? If we're in school, what does that mean that Jesus is Lord in our studies? If we're out buying Christmas presents, what does it mean? What impact does it have? Why does it matter that Jesus is Lord? What does it mean to make Jesus your Lord? There's a Greek word that is translated as Lord. I don't use a lot of Greek. I think it's a useful language. I think it's important. I'm just not good at it. But this is one of the first ones that I learned that's always burned itself in my brain. And that that Greek word that means Lord is a simple word, kurios. K-U-R-I-O. S. Curios. That means Lord. And this word, as you use it in Scripture, has a couple of meanings. And, and this word can mean supreme in authority. It can mean controller. And it can mean Lord. Now, as you hear those, I can already imagine that for some of you, that word controller, right? That, that, that word controller might be a little bit challenging for some of us. Because if Jesus is controller, right? If, if Jesus is controller... He's got a little competition, doesn't he? He's got a little competition right here in our hearts. Because we want to be in control, don't we? Anybody else hate riding in the passenger seat of the car? Right? Anybody ever fight over the TV remote control? It even drives me nuts to watch other people click a remote control. They do it wrong. Knock it off. Give it to me. <sighs> I can, I, like, I, watching you click your TV remote will cause me stress. I have no control issues. <laughs> we want control, don't we? My way, my time, my reasons. I am the boss. Master of my domain. And in contrast to that, what does it mean that Jesus is the supreme authority, that Jesus is the controller, that, that Jesus is Lord? What does it mean to make Jesus Lord of our life? It means you're not in control anymore, that you've surrendered authority. And so what I want to do with the rest of our time this morning is talk about this, surrendering to the Lordship of Christ. How, how, how do we do it? And I want to talk about two different levels of surrender. The first, if you're taking notes, is what I would call the partially surrendered life. The partially surrendered life, right? And, and frankly, I'm afraid that this is where the majority of American Christians live. The partially surrendered life. I mean, I don't know, maybe it's just me. But it seems like at least where I live, the people I live among, there are many people 
that I would call casual Christians or cultural Christians or even Christian atheists. I mean, they believe in God, but they live as if He doesn't exist. It's the partially surrendered life. Luke 6, 46. If you're not familiar with this passage, Jesus was talking about the wise builders and then, in contrast to that, the foolish builders, right? And Jesus says, okay guys, why do you call me Lord, Lord? Why do you call me Lord of your life? Why do you say I am Lord? And then you don't do what I say. I can kind of see Jesus incredulously looking at him. Going, What's up with that? Why would you call me Lord? And then live as if I'm not. Why, why would you just give me this lip service? Jesus says, I don't want lip service. I want life service. I don't want a bunch of talk. I don't just talk the talk. I want you to walk the walk, right? When you're calling me Lord, and then you just do whatever the heck you want to do, this isn't a game, Jesus is saying. Let's, let's get it right. But unfortunately today, I believe there are just so many people who would say, you know, I, yeah, I believe Jesus is Lord, right? But I still want to be in control. Me. I believe Jesus is Lord. But I want to do whatever I want to do. I, I believe Jesus is Lord, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not going to trust him in everything. That's crazy. And so before long, we end up practically, by the, the way that we live, we just take the Bible and say, you know, when it comes to relationships, I know, you know, I'm supposed to pray for those who persecute me. I'm supposed to bless those who hurt me. But, I, you know, I'm supposed to forgive and all that stuff. But you know what they did to me? Forget them. No way. And we just take God's word and we say, forget it. Nah. Don't want to live that. Yeah, he's Lord, but nah, not about this part. I mean, I know I'm supposed to. You know, when it comes to money, I'm supposed to be generous and give. But, nah. I mean, 10%, that sounds like the stupidest thing ever. There's no way I'm ever going to do that. Oh, and I, you know, I know it's, it's supposed to be the way I'm supposed to live. I, yeah, yeah, you know, I, I should serve. I should give of my time. But man, an hour on Sunday is an awful lot to already ask of me, isn't it? There's a lot of people that are kind of like that in our world, right? We live among them. Jesus is no part-time Lord. And he doesn't want part-time followers. When you come to Jesus, he asks you to give your whole life. He says, you know what, if you want to follow me, take up your cross and follow me. He said, if you want to find your life, you got to lose it. If you want to be served, you got to serve. You want to be blessed? You got to bless. Here's a scary one. This is the word of God. You want to be forgiven? You know what the Bible says? You have to forgive. Ouch. You give it away. You surrender. You come under the Lordship of Christ. He is the supreme authority. He is the one that says what is right. He is the one that says what is wrong. He is the one, even if we don't like it, that is the controller. He is Lord of all. And if we are his followers, we come under his Lordship. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to take a moment, literally right now, be very open to 
to what God might show you and ask this question prayerfully. What area have I not surrendered to the Lord? What area of my life am I still trying to control? What area am I unwilling to give to God? What is it? What area am I not fully surrendering to God? Where am I not fully surrendering to the Lordship of Christ? Because I suspect almost all of us, if you're like me, in one way or another, we're all living the partially surrendered life. Where is that for you? You know. God knows. Be honest with him about it. Let's talk about another level of surrender. And that's what Jesus wants for us. And I'd simply call it the fully surrendered life. Fully surrendered as in all in, right? Not a not kind of a Sunday Christian, not kind of when it's a convenient Christian, but a full-on, no holds barred, nothing held back, my life does not belong to me, but it belongs to him, commitment. I love the way the Apostle Paul phrases this and talk about a guy who knew about all in living for Jesus. I love the way he phrases this, phrases this in Romans fourteen seven through 8. He says, for we don't live for ourselves or even die for ourselves. If we live, if we live, it's an honor to the Lord. And if we die, it's to honor the Lord. So whether we live or whether we die, we belong to the curios. We belong to the Lord. We belong to Him. Our life is not our own. We are to surrender to his lordship. We are to belong to him. And here's the deal. When Jesus shed his blood and he died for you and for me, he offered the availability of an absolutely free gift to each and every one of us of salvation. And it's by grace that we are saved through faith. Not at all by works. So we're clear. So that no man might boast. It is the gift of God given to God you. Salvation costs you nothing and it cost Jesus everything. But when you say yes to it, you no longer own the rights to your life. Does that make sense? You belong to him. You surrender to his lordship. Your life is no longer your own. You are no longer the controller. You are no longer the Lord of your life. He is. And that's why I'm so afraid that what I see so much of today is a casual approach to Jesus by so many. That Jesus is simply just that little six pound, eight ounce baby Jesus. That Jesus is just my buddy. Right? That he's the chubby infant away in a manger. Not near away. God's away, somewhere far away, heaven, not near, not in my life, not part of my life. God's God's not close. No, 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 no. Jesus isn't just the little baby in the manger. He's not just the, the Lord Jesus baby in a manger crying, swaddling clothes with cows lowing. He's not even just only the Lord on the cross dying for our sins. What you need to understand about Jesus is that he is the soon returning, conquering, reigning, ruling, supreme authority, coming back with a sword. His name is written on it. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. And he means business. Don't just say, Lord, Lord, then do whatever the heck you want to do. He is the supreme, ruling, reigning King of the universe. Our lives, if you're a Christian, they don't belong to us. They belong to Him. 
And here's the bottom line. The reason so many of us do not surrender in some area of our life to the Lordship of Christ is frankly because we do not know Him in that area of our lives. And you see, to know Him is to love Him. And to know Him is to trust Him. To know Him is to surrender to Him. Because when you know Him, He is the ever-present. He is the all-knowing. He is the all-powerful. He is the good in every possible way. He is holy. He is the one who is setting us apart and He is Himself set apart. He is so holy that mortal man cannot gaze upon Him and live. To know Him is to surrender to Him because He is the reigning, ruling, king of the universe and not only is he indeed that far away in heaven powerful God but he is also a here today and near relational God a God who comes as Emmanuel God with us because he wanted to reveal himself to us that's why he sent Jesus So that we can see Him. So that we can know Him. So that we can relate to Him. So that we can have a love relationship with Him. It's all about relationship, folks. When someone asked Jesus, what is the most important command? His answer was, very simple. It's a relational command. Love the Lord with all your heart, with all your mind with all your soul, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. It's a fully, wholly committed life. It's not partially feel good. I like this, but I don't like that. I'm going to pick this, and I'm not going to pick that. I'm going to do this, but I'm not going to do that. I'm still in control kind of relationship. It's because I know him, and because I love him, and because he knows me, and he loves me, that I surrender. It's all about relationship. You see, there is a really big difference between calling Jesus Lord and surrendering to His Lordship. He is Lord. He is not a part-time Lord. And He does not want part-time followers. Therefore, What we need to do is we need to take whatever it is that we are trying to control and take that to him and get to know him in it and surrender it to his lordship and trust him with all of my heart and lean not on my own understanding, but in all of my ways I will know him. And in that he will make my path straight. This Christmas... Tonight, next Sunday, next Sunday night, as we sing Christmas hymns, as we celebrate Christ, let us do that fully, deeply. Let us do that with Jesus as truly Lord of our lives. Amen. Let's pray.